So today uh, I'll talk about a chasm, a, a fracture, one that is very deep, but also quite special, quite quite awkward. And as it often happens, um, it doesn't help very much for us to study the the chasm by just staring into it, or it's much better to look at the blocks that are separated by it. So this is what we're going to do. But this is also about a journey. And because I think um, some snapshots from the journey might uh, produce some insights, which may be helpful when we under want to understand uh, the fracture a little better. Um, I should add that uh, the journey is not a smooth one. It has its ups and downs, and uh, and yet it is well still full of life and and you know full of color. And it goes without saying that uh, my approach to this kind of journey has to be drastically selective and drastically simplified because you know all these themes can easily lead to and have been leading to, to whole books or the various, or various topics. So we have this um, uh, journey that uh, we will pursue in, in glimpses. And I also want to add that this journey is not going to stay somewhere in the past. It is arriving, it's coming right to our doorstep or beyond. So, uh, after an introduction, this uh, talk will be structured uh, based on a slightly three-step pattern, much like a waltz, like pum pum pum, with uh, the first step being perhaps more strongly emphasized, but the other two steps are also very important. But so let's start with a with a and uh, look at what happens in geography first. And we see, if, if you look at this fracture from the point of view of um, various subfields of geography, looking at journals, uh, publications in journals, uh, listening to people uh, in, in meetings, you see that there is this distinction, but not just distinction, just, I would say, yeah, chasm, between physical geography and, and human geography. And you may say that I'm already biased because I keep uh, mentioning physical geography first. This might be the case. And of, of course, the question arises, so are these two fields really different, so different that they are not, they are not even compatible with each other? Are there repulsive forces at work? And why are those there? And what kind of forces are at work? But then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see that actually there is more than just identification of forces. There are real wedges that seem to be driven and pushing those uh, subfields apart from each other. We also realize uh, quite soon that uh, the issues that we're going to bring up easily overflow the boundaries of the field of geography and they are more general, general enough to be valid in even uh, with respect to issues of our daily life. So what do these groups say about each other? And, and what I'm writing here is based on living experience and reading experience. So I see about human geographers being said that it, the human geography is accused of having values, imbued with values, and being incapable of neutrality and objectivity. And physical geographers add promptly, they lack rigor and they lack generality. What about physical geography? Well, I've seen human geographers writing that physical geography is, is quite unable to properly study the environment because they have to leave out essential issues such as those of 
justice or injustice and ethics in general and human values and so on. And it is philosophically empty. Now, the interesting thing is that when you ask those groups accused of these things, they can answer promptly. You know, uh, human geographers will, I hope you'll confirm, uh, the human geographers out there, uh, they will say values, uh, fair enough, yes, we know what the values are and they are important to us. And generality, thank you very much. Our generality doesn't come from mathematical, uh, mathematical calculations. It's not based on stats. We are looking at things in a different way. And uh, objectivity may not be our main goal. We, we know about this and we are aware of this, but this is not the main issue that we are we're considering. Whereas on the other hand, physical geographers may say, justice, ethics, human values, what does this have to do at all with, with the physical processes that we are looking at? We are interested in science here. Philosophically empty? Sure, I think it is a compliment, they, they say, uh, because this, there can be nothing worse than philosophy. I heard someone saying that, a physicist. There can be nothing worse than, than producing philosophy. Well, the next bad thing would be to read philosophy. So we, I think we have a problem here, because if the geographers can so easily dismiss the negative connotations of all these uh, labels, which are quite a bit exaggerated in my view, if they can dismiss this so easily and be comfortable with, with the, pretty much the statements the way they are, it seems that that opportunity, those opportunities to bridge the gap or to bring those fields closer together, the, the, the chances are quite slim to do that because we are so sure, each of these groups, we are so sure about our, our way of doing things. But are there splits, are there fractures in other fields? Sure they are. And I'm just going to mention some from my experience. I spent a lot of time uh, with uh, working in groups with geologists and uh, geophysicists, and you can see uh, geolog geologists being accused of not doing the real science because geophysics is doing that. So they say, well, Geophysicists say geologists are good at producing the narration. They put certain things together. They write nice papers, but we are doing the real thing. Whereas geologists, I've heard them say, well, geophysics, well, you are useful for us because you are a good instrument, but you're nothing but an instrument. We are the ones putting things together and doing the real science. So you can see the nature of the difference is also already different from the one that we could see in physical geography. And, we, and we'll see in the next few steps how, how, how st strong, how striking this difference is. Something happens also in mathematics. You know, mathematics in pure mathematics are accused of dreaming up issues because they have nothing better to do. And everything they do is useless anyway. Whereas uh, people in pure mathematics talk about the mathematicians that they work at practical applications. And there is nothing worse, nothing you know, dirtier for them than saying you are, guys are looking at applications. They are glued to the mud, glued to the ground. So again, there is clear distinction and there were even conflicts uh, in, in the past uh, between uh, different groups uh, at one university or another. But again, the nature of the, of the difference is not the one we could see uh, in geography. That one is much, much deeper and much, much more general. So when we look at that fracture, we'll consider uh, three different factors. And there are certain characteristics that apply to all of them. First of all, they are not indistinguishable. They are not independent. They are all working together, all these three factors. On the other hand, they are both, all three, involved in that chasm in geography, but not in many other fields. Definitely not in those that I just provided as examples. And, uh, and finally, those that work in geography also seem to be widely applicable beyond the field of geography beyond any field of scholarship uh, and quite you know, deeply going quite deeply into our life, our reality. 
Let's see what these three are. First of all, the approach to change. Second, the different role of positivism on, on the two sides. And third, the different attitude towards questions. So change, positive, uh, positivism and questions are the three types of lens that we will apply to look at the fracture. So we have human geography on one side and physical geography on, on the other side. Well, I'm glad I see I put human geography first here, more balanced. So we have change, positivism and questions. And let's start with the first one. What does change mean? How is change addressed? How important and in what way is it important? Well, the not in terms of change um, emerged much earlier. It could be earlier than that, but as far as we know, it, it, it emerged in quite peculiar conditions, pretty much at the same time. So we have Parmenides on one hand and Heraclitus on the other hand, living at the same time at extreme limits of the Greek world. What are the odds? And with extreme views about change. So we have on one hand Parmenides saying only what is, is. In other words, there is no void. The world is full. And since everything is full, nothing can move. But we see things move. Therefore, every movement is just an illusion. On the, on the other hand, you have Heraclitus saying nothing exists but change. There are normally processes. Objects are an illusion. And he has this example with the, the main example is the flame, which looks like an object, but it's not really an, an object. And he says this is the metaphor for any object for that, for that matter. And of course, then this is decisive force, decisive giant uh, that was Plato, uh, who looks at, uh, at, at these extremes and says, well, regardless of what they say, what we should see is what is really important. And what is important is the permanent, not the ephemeral, not the change. Actually, we are not really good at grasping the change. We are not really, really able to grasp the change very well. It is the permanent that counts. So we have been developing in a way in this tension, you know, between the blue but I, I call here no change, Parmenides, and the green Heraclitus only change. And science has been developing in that tension, but this tension didn't last very long because quite, quite soon its environment was invaded by the blue, by the no change uh, view. What do I mean by this? Of course, science studies processes by its very nature, we are very interested, variability and so on. But we look at change as long as it is able to reveal something that is unchanging, as long as we are able to grasp something that is permanent, like the laws. So we're not looking for at the change for the sake, for the change's sake. So we have a focus on the permanent, on the reproducibility, and on invariance, and we know that invariants are uh, properties that do not change when some transformation is applied. So invariants are really important. And I'll give you, give you an example here: something that is really obviously changing all the time, such as wind speed. This is a typical record for wind speed. But when we study the variability, what we want to do is to associate with it some kind of number that would tell us how rough this landscape is. And of course, we can do much better than the classical, I don't know, uh, uh, statistical moments, uh, standard variation and so on. And uh, in nonlinear science, we have this uh, persistence exponent, h exponent that characterizes variability. But look at it, it's just a number. So we are interested in the way this number characterizes, it, characterizes the whole pattern. The number does not change. So in science, we are not interested in the unique, not even if it's purely necessarily unique, such as, I don't know, a cosmic event like this supernova. Uh, and uh, we are looking at invariants, we are looking at laws and so on, and the ephemeral is ignored. Whereas in the humanities, well, 
we are not interested in the average number of leaves uh, dropping from a tree per hour. We are interested even in the trace of one single leaf that it may leave in, its, in the air. And we are looking at the experience, the experience of the person who looks at that tree, follows that leaf. We are looking at the experience of a life. This is very, very, very different. So we recognize the value of the unique works of art, for example, artistic performance and so on. They have uniqueness as its, its essential trait. So experience is important, experience uni is unique and it's valuable. And variety is relevant. Variety is not there for us just to, to be squeezed into boxes, but rather to look at and to understand better the, the world with the people in, in it. So let's look at an example, climate change. Well, in physical geography, when we hear about narratives, we say, okay, interesting. Let's see what they have in common. What is their main core? and how we can use this in order to find out about the non-changing, the general. And otherwise, we are quite, quite skeptical about it. I, I listened to a paper on climate change, which consisted from the beginning to the end of a history of a certain person in Australia who went through all kinds of adventures in his life. And at the very end, there was no conclusion. And I thought, was this a paper about climate change? Well, it was, but it was seen in a different way. Well, for the, the human in human geography, we see the value of those experiences. And in the end, all these manifestations are unique. Whether or not we, we begin to use boxes and squeeze them into those boxes, the reality is that the world is expressed through unique events. And when it comes to life, well, the picture becomes already different and uh, the values are different. So that is one wedge, the attitude towards change. That is quite different between physical geography and human geography. What about positivism? Well, I would say with all the bad connotations that are quite abundant sometimes. Positivism was created with the best of intentions and it actually led to some really positive implications. And I, and I provide here some positive aspects of positivism uh, because it, it emerged maybe not starting with Auguste Comte, but maybe probably he's the, the, the best representative uh, for this current. It started from the from a need for rigor, a need to put things in place, the need a need to understand things properly, rather than you know having a a mess of of data floating around. So it highlights the importance of scientific method and empirical observation. And uh, how do we assess those uh, facts that we collect by empirical observation using mathematics and we interpret them in the framework of some theory. Now, the key word here is always clarity. And we need clarity when we get the data, we need clarity when we discover the laws. The problem was that positivists had no, at the time at least, had no hesitation to require everything to belong to that pattern. So they wanted to go from physics to sociology, to psychology, and so on. And if you can do something in one field, like the physics, why not do it in, an, in other fields? And you know, we are, we are amphibious beings. We are quite able to live in different types of environment. Human geography, physical geography, humanities, physics, and so on. Poetry, philosophy. Not our methods. Our methods may behave like, I know, you know, a method may behave like a fish, maybe a long fish, maybe a beautiful fish, maybe amazing fish. But as long as you, as soon as you bring it on land, uh, it is it is incapable of doing an, anything, and and it, it may even die. Now, this happens also when you try to pull the uh, certain methods to the wrong the wrong field. So, whereas for physical geography, this went very well, worked very well with quantitative analysis emphasizing the measurable and so on. It was clearly a problem 
uh, when human geographers were expected to find the same rigor, the same quantitative analysis uh, results and so on in their field. And that is a source of a, of a wedge. Now, can we do anything about it? Of course, I was you know, intrigued uh, by, by the idea. How come that people don't try to do? Of course they did. And I picked just a few examples. Uh, probably the best well known. And Bottimer has this positive, post positivist approach, trying to put together subjective perceptions and objective analysis of the environment. Then, probably better known, Roy Baskar, he says we, don't, we should not look for the quantitative laws, but rather focus on active mechanisms which can be identified both in the humanities and in the uh, uh, physical sciences. And then Maple Kwan, more recently, uh, she produced a called hybrids by trying to integrate spatial analysis and lived experience, uh, and lived experience at the same time. Now, does this work? Well, since we are still here with the wedge right deep, painfully deep in, in our field, apparently it doesn't. And uh, I think one of the reasons is that their capacity of being generalized beyond the limited uh, area where they were uh, applied in, their, in those studies, that, 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 that is a problem. Uh, so that claim for real integration might not be very realistic. What about nonlinear science? Maybe there is something there. And I think there are some good premises. For example, uh, we can apply network theory to emphasize connections between different types of nodes that may have all kinds of meanings. It can be people, they can be groups, they can be in, in human geography, they can be uh, I don't know, um, earthquakes in, uh, in geoscience. On the other hand, instead of having those disturbing <coughs> hierarchic levels, we, we may have a branching structure like the one, the one symbolized by a tree. Uh, you know, Antoine de saint exupéry uh, uh, writes in one of his books, a tree, he says, a tree is hierarchy, but where do you see one part dominating over another? So, these, I think, would, could be good premises, but as soon as you come with, with, with uh, a field that already has science in the title or has a flavor of a science, this creates an allergic reaction which now can be much better understood in the light of what we have just seen in terms of positivism and human journey. So, number three. And this one, I think, is the most important and the most serious issue, our approach to questions. And uh, I think that the, 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 main, uh, the main discovery, I would say, in this, in this regard uh, is due to Isaiah Berlin. I, I find him one of the most uh, brilliant philosophers of the 20th century. We did not talk about different fields, he did not talk about fractures and so on, but he distinguished two types of approaches to questions. One of them he called monism, and by the way, monism in the sense of Berlin, this is what I'm talking about. So not monism as opposed to dualism and so on, nothing to do with religion or anything. Monism he defines by three, follow, the three following traits. One of them is this. The premise that every real question has one true answer. If there is no answer, there is no question. And by the way, uh, he was quite realistic. He's, he's not naive. He says, well, we may not know the question. I may not know the question, but maybe you can. You will find the answer. I, I know may, may not know the answer, but you may find the answer. Maybe we can't find the answer today, but we may find the answer in the future. Maybe not in this field, maybe with the help from other fields. So the answer might be there. So, the, But the answer should exist and should be one true answer. Number two, these answers are knowable. They are accessible. They are not uh, somewhere floating beyond uh, the boundaries of, of knowledge. Even more than that, 
there are methods that can be taught and can be learned about how to find those uh, answers. And for example, in the Enlightenment, uh, those uh, methods were very clearly defined. There were mathematics and sciences. That was very clear. So there are answers, they are noble. And finally, the, the third important point, all these answers, true answers, have to be compatible with each other. If you have a true answer to a question, you cannot have another true answer that contra another question that contradicts them. So all the answers to all questions must be compatible with each other. And as Abelin points out, this premise, this what he calls monism, this set of premises, has been dominating Western thought for two millennia. From the very beginnings of, of Greek, ancient, ancient, ancient Greek philosophy, all the way to the Enlightenment, all the way into Romanticism. But then things change. And the, the alternative is what he calls pluralism. Again, pluralism in the sense that this is a, a way of thinking that contradicts all these three premises. It does rate this. So it is interesting to see how, how this pluralism grew already within the Enlightenment, Enlightenment, which was so so strongly based, so clearly based on on monism. So I'll give you a few examples here. The, probably the best well known, Herder, great figure of the Enlightenment. But look what he was saying: each civilization has its own way of thinking and of feeling and of acting. You cannot judge another, another culture based on your own standards. Now, he was clearly talking against Europocentrism. He was talking about other cultures in, in South America, for example, or, or, or elsewhere. They said they have different ways of thinking. They have to be assessed according to their the different standards. You, don't, you can't use just your European scale over there. On the other hand, there is no single set of answers. A question may have different answers, and they might not even be compatible, or they may not even the same answer now or later on. And what I found amazing was that he was already aware of the fact that the physical processes, physical things in nature matter, has to be addressed with a different approach, different methods than the field of where human spirit is at work. And he advocated for qualitative and quantitative factors being uh, applied as well. And then there is this uh, uh, amazing force, Hamann, Johann Georg Hamann, the most extreme enemy of the Enlightenment is called by Berlin. He condemns simply monism, everything that has a flavor of a theory of generalization because he said life is so rich, any tendency to catch it in, in, in rigid forms is, must lead to failure. But what he was actually doing was to oppose what he was calling Newtonization of knowledge, applying Newton's approach, which was amazingly uh, effective, amazingly successful in the physical sciences, applying in that in every other field of, of human thinking, every other field of human activity. And he was totally uh, uh, against that. And there's another example, Montesquieu, for example, already also underlined that humans are not, uh, are not the same everywhere, and there may not be one and the same thing that make people happy here and there. So if you ask a question, what makes you happy? It is only natural and expected to have different answers from different types of culture. So you see, this is pluralism. These are clear uh, ways of crack go going all the way uh, against the, the three premises of monism. Now, what about geography? Well, we have physical geography that is um, in not just imbued, relying on science, and we better have well-defined answers in science, and we better have w uh, uh, answers that are compatible with each other, and so on. On the other hand, you have 
pluralism in geography where you want, in human geography, where you have want to take in consideration the diversity of people, the fact that answers can be answers can be different, the answers don't, don't even have to be compatible with each other and so on. And, and, and these roots in different places can only drive these fields apart. I think that it is only when I, when I saw this that I thought, wow, the chances for human geography and physical geography to find common ground become l less and less substantial because there is no reason, no way to expect physical geography to give up on monism and adopt pluralism or human geography doing the opposite or both mixing them all together. That would be complete nonsense. So what happened next? Well, we have to move uh, a little bit further and uh, look at postmodernism, which based on pluralism reached some very interesting conclusions. For example, there are no objective facts. Nothing is objective. There are only interpretations. Well, on the other hand, depending on, perspe on the, your perspective, you can have different interpretations. So uh, you see a coffee mug here, but if you look from the other side, it may look like, look like a bicycle. And if you look from up there, it may look like a rabbit that is jumping at a carrot. Maybe they didn't mean them right like, like that, but they meant it seriously. One more statement. People construct their own reality and then they behave accordingly. So in a way, it's much like saying we each live in our, in our world and due to a miraculous coincidence, we are still able to communicate with each other. Not to say that this is not to say that quite a few of them uh, had doubted that the, the, the very chance, uh, the slimmest, the slightest chance for people to communicate with each other. I remember one of them uh, claiming that uh, he had finally proven that communication is impossible and there is no reason to write anything, whether prose or poetry or whatever, because communication is in the reality is that communication is not possible. It, that, it went that far. And then the crown, the crown of things, there are only relative truths. There are no, in, there are no solid truths. There are only individual truths. Nobody is objectively right or wrong. Everything depends on, everything goes. Everything depends on a perspective. And after postmodernism, which flourished in the second half of the century, of, of the 20th century, we have post-truth right now. Some claim that it is just beginning, but we are right in it now. And when you have no right or wrong, no way of finding out whether this is this or it or it isn't and so on, it is much like having your rug continuously pulled from under you. And it's interesting to see that, oh, many, many years ago, Aristotle warned us about this. He said, those who are not serious, well, say that nothing has been or will be except as it has been believed to be. In other words, what you believe to be, that is what it is. So it is good to see that the public still reacts. And when some politicians make some outrageous statements, uh, people pay attention. And the good sign was the fact that uh, just in a couple of months, George Orwell's 1984 went right to the top of the sales on, on, Amazon, on Amazon. However, it's not so easy. We may be able to notice that, which is good. We, we, we notice blatant uh, distortions of truth. However, Hannah Arendt um, warned us quite a long time ago that at some point, people will be forced to disregard the distinction between truth and falsehood. You can't stand, you know, can't stand this ambiguity for a very long time. At some point you say, I give up. And Carl Sagan, you know, the uh, astrophysicist, unable to distinguish between what feels good and what's true, we slide back into darkness. And more recently, Tim Snyder, when we give up on truth, we concede power, we give up power to those with the wealth and charisma to create spectacle in its place. And what is even worse is the complication, 
citizens cannot form the civil society that would allow them to defend themselves. So the problem is that when the compass is broken and you don't know where you are, you don't know where to go, uh, there is no way to find out anything. On top of all the reasons we have for anxiety, we have this. On top of all the reasons we have for stress, we have this. And stress and anxiety have been exerted for a long time. There's no, no surprise that they may lead to depression. So to make a long story short, we have for one question, the following possibilities. Monism, there is one true answer. Pluralism, there is more than one answer. Then a further development of pluralism, there are not just a couple of answers, there can be many answers. But this went way beyond that level and we got here to any answer. A question can have any answer. This depends on who is saying what, at what point, and so on. So that is already in the post-truth territory. When truth is not a fact, nothing to do with facts, it's based on feelings, and feelings can be fabricated, can be induced. Facts can and should be disregarded, and truth is just plastic. It can be shaped, and it's shaped by the powers to be. So, what can we do? There are certain things that I think we can already tell. There are other things that we might not even, not even be able to imagine right now. But one thing is that, to leave, that we have to leave something behind, something like this. No, this kind of, this kind of garbage. Then we have to leave behind, I guess, something that is not acceptable, such as intolerance. So that has to go because we can't move forward on our journey. If we want to continue our journey together, that would not work. But the same applies to tolerance. And uh, this might seem surprising. Well, I think that the form of the word of these words is misleading because tolerance seems to be the opposite of in intolerance. It isn't. Tolerance is just one step away from intolerance. You tolerate and tolerate and tolerate until you don't tolerate anymore. One of, some, some of the, the, the most disastrous um, um, events in history, ugly events in the history of humanity, occurred because of tolerance that reached a certain threshold when it turned into intolerance. So tolerance is better than intolerance, but it is not sustainable. What is sustainable is this, understanding respect for the other. And you see, I pointed one more arrow. I didn't dare to add the word there because if you, if you say that people should uh, actually be penetrated by love for human, for, for, their, for their human fellows, may, they, they, it, it may look out like a stretch, but the arrow is there. So it, when it comes to physical geography and human geography, I think this is something we can do understand why, where the other is coming from, why they are doing what they are doing, and, uh, and see that what they do is worthy of respect, even if their premises are different. But their premises are clearly stated, what they do is clearly stated, and they have different goals, different means. All right, so we are here on our, on our, on our journey and we may ask ourselves okay uh, what's the point of all of this and then we have this really really mind-blowing answer from Walt Whitman uh, the, the, the answer is that you are here and reality exists and identity and that the powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. The powerful play goes on and you may contribute a verse. I find it amazing that the human being can't come up with this. And yet, I'm afraid that this still wouldn't do. This is not enough. It might have been enough in the past, but not now. Just each of us coming up with one verse is not enough. I think we'd better get together and think about our verses and make our verses match and 
and, and go into a coherent direction. And the, 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 the impression that, well, we are here each on our own, I think uh, is quite pervasive, but we know that this is not true. I mean, as long as you, as, as soon as you look around you, you realize that, no, this is not a journey that uh, we have all uh, to take on our own. We are pretty much together in this. We are pretty much together in almost every kind of trouble <laughs> that may occur, whether it's climate or war or natural or technological hazards or who knows what, what, what else. But we are all together. And uh, I, I think it's more like we are a small group of people on a tiny island. And since the, 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 the group is so tightly bound and the island is so tiny, what you do counts. And what you say counts. And what you think counts. And I, I, I think this is, an, a good, this is good news because it means that we don't just have to sit back and wait for things to happen. It's certainly it's it's not easy, especially when you don't know what is up, where is up and where is down, what is true and what isn't, and the fog, mind you, may become thicker and thicker. However, there's no way to go other than forward, and I think it's important that all these difficulties don't make us believe, even for a second, that we should give up. I think when it comes to that, it would be great if we, if we could in, somehow in, implement in our DNA two different things, not being getting much more intelligent because we've seen that intelligence, you know, uh, uh, evolving in the same way doesn't help. No, I think the two traits that I would like to see ingrained in, uh, in our DNA is caring for each other and never ever giving up and you know and if we are able to wander together to to, to suffer together to uh, ask questions together i think we should be also be able to rejoice together and this is something that uh, we should uh, we should remember we should not forget so these are some picture credits That is the story of a fracture. Okay. Thank you so much, Christian, for a wonderful talk. Now we open up the floor to everybody. Uh